That's Bobber down. Give it to him for three, two, one. There we go. All right, guys. This is a video all about bobber fishing. We are gonna go so deep on bobber fishing. You are gonna know everything you, well, this is a good one. You are gonna know everything you need to know about how to catch walleyes on bobbers after this video is done. Well, if I can ever land this fish. <laughs> I guess first things first, what do you put on a bobber? That is the question. Now the very, very most popular thing that people put on bobbers is a big jumbo leech. I, have, I happen to run into the bait shop and find a really nice pile of awesome leeches. That's a pretty good fish. Nets are sometimes helpful, but we're just gonna go right in for the boat side land. There you go. As a bobber eater right there, a nice solid fish. And it went on a little tungsten jig and, ooh, he's hooked good, there you go. A little tungsten jig and a, uh, a jumbo leech. So beautiful fish right there, back in the drink. Another option that you can put on the back of a bobber is a night crawler. When you go to the bait shop, night crawlers come in little, uh, containers like that in the, in the fridge in the back. Uh, but what we got today is this juicy, juicy specimen right here. I'll show you kind of what you're looking for. Big, dark, <laughs> kind of hard to show to the camera, but this is a, this is a good one. If it's about as big as your, as your, about as thick as your thumb, that's how you know it's a good leech. So we're gonna run through kind of a few of the components next. Um, I'm just gonna go from top to bottom so you have everything that you need to know uh, as far as the component tree because of any walleye tactic, uh, bobber fishing is probably the most complex with all of the different component tree that you need, all the different beads, the weights, the bobbers, the stoppers, the line, rod and reel. So we're gonna break down that entire system right now. Okay, so the whole system, there's a lot to it, so stick with me, I'll try and be as fast as possible. On the business end, I like to run a small little hook. So this is a 16th ounce tungsten short shank hook, or jig I should say. Uh, this is Northland's model. You can do a number of different colors. There's a few different thoughts you could do. Uh, you can do like something like black or green pumpkin type color uh, to have something that's the most natural possible presentation. Uh, this is something that I would consider to be in between. This is blue and white. Um, and this just tends to be a good overall walleye color. So when you're thinking about jig color, just think about some of your favorite colors on that body of water. And uh, oftentimes that's gonna get it done. So uh, another really good option that I like a lot is chartreuse. So uh, I like blue, I like chartreuse, and I like the natural like black or green pumpkin. Now moving on up from there, actually before we move on up, uh, also you can just run just like a straight hook. And in a lot of cases, if I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna use a number two hook at the absolute biggest. If you're targeting bigger fish, um, a number two octopus hook is a good option. Uh, but oftentimes a number four can be a little bit better. So a little bit of a uh, smaller, smaller option there can be, can be good. And then if you are just using a plain hook, then you're gonna want, so this is, the, this is the leader line right here. If you're using a plain hook, you're gonna want to have a couple split shots about halfway down the leader, uh, just because if you have just a plain hook, obviously you need some sort of weight to pull that bait down into the zone. So I love a 16th ounce jig just because you throw this out. Um, there's actually a weight a little bit farther up on the system, but uh, you throw it out, the heavier weight pulls down and then your jig just kind of pendulums down in front of the fish. So I find that to be a really good system, but let's move up from there. Uh, from there I like about a three foot leader um, and this is six pound fluorocarbon. Fluorocarbon is awesome because it sinks 
It helps with getting that bait down a little bit better, but more importantly, uh, fluorocarbon is awesome because it's more invisible. I fish really clear water, so six pound tends to be the key for me. Um, but if you're fishing waters that's a little bit dingier, you can go up to eight pound. You could do 10, it wouldn't be my choice, but if you're fighting big fish and it's dingier water, you can get away with it. So that's my thought with the leader line. And then going from there, I have a nice ball bearing swivel. Uh, if you got a leech down there, you can actually, I didn't mention this earlier in the video, you can put a minnow on there too. Um, if you have something like that and it's swimming, you know, it's going to spin your line a little bit. So having a swivel is nice, but the important part about having a swivel is just the fact that you need something that's going to stop this bobber from crashing all the way down to your bait, uh, all the way down to your line essentially. So you have a swivel here and from there you go from a swivel to a bead. And generally with these beads, I like to go more high vis. Um, and then I'll have a little bullet weight right here. So this is a little tungsten weight. Um, and what this does is when you cast out, that tungsten weight comes down and then the bait comes after it, like I mentioned before. And just above that tungsten weight, um, I will put a big old bobber. This is the light bite bobber. This is the biggest size they have. The reason why I like the bigger bobber um, is just because then you can use a heavier bullet weight just below it. And this doesn't have to be a bullet weight, but I like bullet weights for whatever reason. And whenever you're, you're rigging it, um, make sure you have it kind of where uh, the bottom part of it is down by the swivel. So above that, I'll actually put a few beads above it. And you really only need one, but I, ha I think having more doesn't hurt you. Um, so the biggest thing is making sure that you have any kind of bead because what's going to happen is you're going to cast this thing out. This uh, weight is going to pull this whole swivel and the rest of the leader down. And then this bobber is going to slide up the line and stay on the surface because the bobber floats and the weights don't float. So what you need, the only thing left that you really need in this whole system um, is a bobber stop. So. Here's my bobber stop. It's a little bit of a mess. Uh, the thing with bobber stops is if it's working, don't mess with it. So I've just kind of left this on here. Uh, one thing that you can do if you're having problems with uh, your beads going through the bobber stop, obviously getting a smaller bead is going to be critical. But if you don't have one of those on hands, you, hand, you can actually put two bobber stops on there. So something to think about, something to consider. Uh, for my main line, I have braided line. So this is eight pound braid. Um, another good option that you can use is monofilament line. And one of the benefits to monofilament is the fact that your bobber stop is going to stick more to kind of like that tacky uh, monofilament line versus the braid can be a little bit more slippery. Um, and the bobber slop stop can slip uh, the particular bobber stop I got on here right now works really good. It doesn't slip at all. Um, I'm very happy with it. So uh, it works great on my braided line. And I will link all of the gear that I'm talking about. Um, I'll link it down in the description of this video. I might put it, I might pin it in a comment as well. But if not, just look in the description. Um, so braided line is what I like. And the reason why I like braid uh, is just because I feel like you get the best castability with it. Um, I like that, uh, probably the number one reason why I like it is I feel like you get better hook sets. Uh, the thing with bobbers, if you've ever watched any videos on bobbers, you've probably seen people explain it, where the thing about bobbers is when you're going to set the hook, your line is kind of in an L shape. So basically you have your bobber right here and you have your line going straight down and then you have your line going back to the boat like this. So what you need to do when you set the hook is do more of a reeling hook set. You need to tighten up that line as much as possible. And if you're using mono, you have a little bit more stretch in that system. Um, so you don't get as positive of a hook set as you would with braided line. Uh, so I am using braid mainly for that reason. Uh, if you are spooling up and you already have line on your reel, 
that's fine. Just make sure that it's not fluorocarbon because fluorocarbon is not viable for this presentation as your main line. You want fluorocarbon as your leader, but on your main line, uh, you need something that is either neutral in the water or floats um, and braid sinks. And if you, excuse me, uh, not braid, fluorocarbon sinks. So if you cast out, your line is gonna be sinking, sinking, sinking. Your bobber is gonna be up in the air. Your line's gonna be five feet below the surface and it's just gonna be a mess when you try and uh, catch a fish. So that is a quick run through. Um, I guess lastly, we'll talk about rod and, and reel. Um, for me, the reel doesn't make a huge difference. You just want something, I like something a little bit bigger, you know, a 2,000, 3,000 size. Uh, you don't need like a big 4,000 or whatever. Um, but just something that's gonna have a good, um, a good drag is gonna be key because you might catch a giant fish on it. So um, this one right here, what do I even have on here? I have a 2,500 size Daiwa Fuego. Um, Fuego is a good cheap reel. Uh, there's a lot of good solid reels um, in the market out there for about a hundred bucks. So uh, that's what I would recommend. Unless you wanna get fancy and get a nicer reel, but I don't think it's super necessary for this presentation. Um, but one thing I do think is super key is having a longer rod. So this one right here is big. So this one is an eight foot Apex Pro and uh, the power in action on this is medium light. Uh, I don't need something, I don't need a broomstick. I still like to have kind of that medium light power in a rod um, and then a fast action is how this is set up. So for me, this is my go-to bobber setup. Um, longer rods for me is really key for two reasons basically. The first reason is gonna be what we talked about earlier where you have so much slack in your line. It's nice to have a rod that's longer so you have a little bit more play when you're setting the hook. Uh, a lot of how I'm optimizing my gear is kind of optimized around that hook set. So you're making sure you're getting a good hook in the fish. Um, but the second reason why I like to have a longer rod is because when you go and cast this bait out, um, what you're gonna do is you're gonna reel it up so the bobber is fairly close to the tip of the rod. And then you're still gonna have your three foot leader just dangling down there. So you have a lot of extra line that you have to cast. And if you're using like a really short, if you're using like a really short rod, uh, you just don't have as much length where you don't have as much length that you can play with for casting. So um, because that leader is fairly long um, and you obviously can't reel the bobber up into your guides, um, it's important to have a longer rod. So that's big for me and that's also you know, I think if you're in like really clear water and the fish are pressured, uh, of course, would you maybe get more bites if you had a longer leader? Yes, um, but that makes castability really difficult. That's why I go with the three, three foot, um, three foot leader. You could even go shorter. You could go, you know, two and a half feet or whatever. So anyway, uh, that is the full breakdown on uh, the entire bobber system. So. Uh, any other info I need to add to that? No, I don't think so. Um, I like having high visibility um, bobber stops, high visibility beads, high visibility bobbers. All that is really important because when you cast out, you know, you're kind of watching the entire system and you're watching to see, you know, if something got tangled up and uh, if the bobber stop is going all the way to the bobber, um, sometimes you might have your bobber set too short, uh, or excuse me, your hold, you might have your uh, bobber stop set too deep. So if you're in shallow water, that jig might just crash all the way down to the bottom. So um, in that case, the bobber stop won't make it all the way to the bobber. So there's a lot to think about, um, but high visibility is important for so many reasons. And long rod is very important. Braided line is what I prefer. Um, and then I will make one more note uh, on the business end. I prefer jigs purely for the reason that um, I have found that jigs don't get fouled up nearly as much as just a plain hook with split shots up on the line. So I feel like I got a little bit long-winded on sort of that whole setup, uh, but it's important, there's a lot there. And now we're gonna talk a little bit about bobber fishing strategies.
Now one of the biggest disadvantages, in my opinion, of bobber fishing is just the fact that when you're running and gunning, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to always account for how deep you have the jig set. Now if you're just kind of fishing in an area where all the fish are roughly the same depth down, uh, it's not as big of a deal, but if you're in a spot where the fish are kind of all over the place and uh, some are on the bottom, some are halfway down, you name it, then uh, that can be a difficult place. That's a, that's a time when I often will use a jig, maybe instead of a bobber. Um, but the power of the bobber is you can just hang that bait right in front of the fish and just tantalize them like no other presentation. Um, but for me, one of the biggest downsides is when those fish are high and those fish are low and you need to adjust your bobber every cast based on what you're looking at. Um, forward facing sonar paired with a bobber is a deadly, deadly weapon. So you're seeing right there that fish came up and charged it. Can't believe you didn't grab it. Um, it's a deadly, deadly weapon, but it is kind of a pain in the pain in the butt versus just using a jig that you can, you know, let drop down to the level of the fish or raise up and keep it up there. Look at those two fish looking at that. Is he going to bite it? I wonder if he knows that he's allowed to bite it. <laughs> he's still looking at it. So one of the biggest secret weapons of bobber fishing um, is pairing it with live scope. But you don't necessarily have to have live scope to have success with bobbers. I mean, guys have been using bobbers forever, but they've kind of had a resurgence in, re in recent years because of live scope. Um, and uh, obviously to take a bobber and throw it at a mark is a powerful tool, but if you don't have that technology, you can just use this tactic in locations um, that you've caught walleyes in before, you know? Um, let's see, I still have my leech on there. You can just set up camp on a point, a weed flat, a rock pile, any of the above, and have success throwing bobbers. It's one of those tools where uh, you don't even have to be moving. These walleyes are moving. They're moving in and out of structure. They're moving all the time. So if you're in a high percentage spot, you can just soak a bobber in that spot and call it good. You know, back in the day, guys would, uh, it kind of became really popular um, around the Midwest where guys would just drop the anchor, cast about 70 feet downwind onto a rock pile and just let that bobber soak and uh, wait for the walleyes to come in. You know, they would sit down, crack a beer and, and wait for the walleyes. Um, you can still do that today, you know? Just because we have all this technology at our, at our fingertips doesn't mean those tactics don't work anymore. Walleyes are all over the water column. And if you're targeting fish that are 10 feet down, but your bobber is 15 feet down, uh, that's gonna be an issue. Or in this case, the bobber is set 10 feet down, like it, but they'll still swim up. So my advice when you're setting the bobber depth, obviously if you have forward facing sonar and you can look at them, or if you have 2D sonar, you see them underneath the boat and you wanna plop a bobber down and, and let the fish come and eat it. Oh, he got it. My advice, would be leaning towards having that bobber set a little bit higher because the fish are a lot more likely to come up and grab it. Um, if you're too far, if you're too far above the fish, uh, they're not, they might not be willing to commit to going that far. Um, but if you crash it down past them with the bobber, that usually doesn't work as often. Um, not to say that, not to say that it would never work, but it works less often than just having it above the fish. So show you this guy really quick. That one went on the jig as well. Here's our buddy, the Walter. 
but one of the biggest downsides of bobbers is just the fact that you need to adjust it as you go. Um, if one of the most deadly weapons ever is using forward facing sonar with a bobber and that's something that's really blown up over the years and kind of increased the popularity of bobber fishing for walleyes. Um, but one of the biggest disadvantages is you constantly need to be moving that slip knot. Um, so if that's something that you don't want to do or something that's annoying to you, grab a jig and a crawler, a jig and a leech, a jig and a plastic, and uh, you're gonna have ultimate flexibility of, you know, pulling that jig up, letting it crash down to bottom because the fish is on the bottom, whatever it is. Um, jigs are a lot more versatile for that reason, um, but the bobber setup can get bites when nothing else will. So as much as it, as much as it's, it, it is a pain in the butt to move that bobber stop up and down, depending on what you're seeing, um, the biggest problem is, yeah, you might see a walleye that's six feet up and next thing you know, you're pulling your bobber stop, you know, 10 feet, you know, from where it was before. So to me, where bobbers really, really shine is number one, when the walleyes aren't biting anything else, but also number two, when I'm fishing like a flat where there's no depth changes and most of the walleyes are set up kind of in the same depth level. So maybe you're nine feet of water and most of the walleyes are two feet off. You know, in that case, you know, you have basically seven feet of water there. I'll set my bobber, you know, about six feet down. So the walleye have to come up about a foot to come up and get, or a foot and a half would be a good, a good, uh, distance for them to travel. So just something to think about, uh, something to think about when you're considering whether or not to use a bobber. It's like a couple walleyes right there on the edge. So I am a big, big fan of using, of using bobbers to target walleyes that are out suspended. Um, but another, another tactic or another spot where I love to use bobbers is when I'm trying to catch walleyes that are right on the edge of cover. So cover will usually hold walleyes a little bit better. Um, one of the toughest parts about catching uh, walleyes on bobbers is the fact that it's not like a highly mobile technique. Um, oop, the bobber just went down. I like to give it to him for just a second and then reeling hook set and then straighten it out with a full blown hook set after that. But the reeling part is important because you gotta tighten up the slack a little bit. Uh, but that was a perfect example of a type of walleye that I like to target with this presentation. Um, those are walleyes that are sitting on the side of weeds. Um, and sometimes, you know, a lot, of, a lot of fish that are just kind of on an open flat, they're just kind of cruising around. If you drop a bobber in front of their face, Oh, that one just shook off. Perfect. Nice, easy release. Um, if you drop a bobber, you know, in their general vicinity, they're just going to keep cruising. Uh, sometimes they'll stop and check it out. Um, but stuff that's by like the edge of weeds or a rock pile or something like that, a lot of times those fish are hanging out in that area a little bit longer. Um, so you're going to have the opportunity to have more fish interested in it. Um, but yeah, like as far as, you know, the sizes of the schools or anything like that, you know, I've, I've used this tactic to catch individual marks, to catch, to, you know, throwing this in the, the middle of a big school of walleyes can be really effective. Like this looks like a, like a little school, little school of walleyes right, right there in front of us there. Uh, another thing to consider too, especially when you're fishing really shallow. Oh, he's, oh, the bobber is already down. Ooh, he dropped it. I think I, he didn't drop it. I tore it out of his mouth. You got to give them, you got to give them the bait a little bit, a little bit longer. That's a good lesson. I'll, I will also add, you know, when you're using a big juicy leech or even a night crawler or a minnow, any of the above, you need to let the fish eat it. That is very, very critical um, because it's a big piece of meat and because you're not working it aggressively, fish don't usually come up and, you know, crunch it and send it halfway down their throat. Uh, because, because it's a really finessey presentation, usually fish just come up and grab it. Um, and 
when they do that, you got to give it to them for a second. I think we have our bobber stop set at a pretty good height for these, this little crew. We're in a little bit of shallower water. It, I don't think it will be an issue today because of the wind, but if you are ever using bobbers in a situation where uh, there's less wind and maybe you're in shallow water, um, in those cases, you can spook fish um, from the splash of the bobber on the surface. So that is something to consider. Um, sometimes what you need to do is you need to cast out in front of uh, cast out in front of the fish and then pull the bobber over. And we do have a bobber down right there. That was a good little pod. Give it to him for a second. There we go. I can already tell you it's not going to be, well, it's not going to be a giant, but it's going to be a good, perfect eater size fish. This is such a cool, such a cool way to catch them too. It's so fun to watch that bobber go down. Mostly because you know when it does go down, you got something like this on the, on the other end. So uh, this is a good way to get them. Pointing, shooting, stuff like that. It can be ridiculously good on some days. Um, but another great way to catch them, especially if you don't have super good sonar technology, is you can just mark fish underneath you. As soon as you mark it, deploy that bobber, let that thing go down to uh, depth, and then, you know, just let that bobber sit there. And that's a tactic that we used to use all the time on Mille Lacs before forward-facing sonar um, is, you know, kind of called a power corking was the name of the strategy where you'd actually go, you may even have your big engine on, but uh, you could have your trolling motor and you could just be ripping down the brake and then you see a fish or a pair of fish or a pot of fish drop down on them and then uh, that thing will go down and then you just go, you watch the bobber, you give it like 10, 15 seconds if they don't bite it, reel it up and go to the next one. So that's another really cool way um, to fish bobbers and yeah so for me there's three ways to do it there's pointing and shooting with forward facing sonar there's power corking like that um, and then the last option for me is just going to be setting up camp in a good area getting bobbers downwind just letting them rest and waiting for them to go down when you're set up on a really good spot it might be a weed line it might be a point it might be a rock pile